Chapter 2 One time, when I was in a blind in a tree, waiting motionless for game to wander by, I dozed off and fell ten feet to the ground, landing on my back. It was as if the impact had knocked every wisp of air from my lungs, and I lay there struggling to inhale, to exhale, to do anything. That's how I feel now, trying to remember how to breathe, unable to speak, totally stunned as the name bounces around the inside of my skull. Someone is gripping my arm, a boy from the seam, and I think maybe I started to fall and he caught me. There must have been some mistake. This can't be happening. Prim was one slip of paper in thousands. Her chances of being chosen so remote that I'd not even bothered to worry about her. Hadn't I done everything? Taken the tessery, refused to let her do the same. One slip, one slip in thousands. The odds had been entirely in her favor. But it hadn't mattered. Somewhere far away, I can hear the crowd murmuring unhappily as they always do when a twelve-year-old gets chosen because no one thinks this is fair. And then I see her, the blood drained from her face, hands clenched in fists at her sides, walking with stiff small steps up toward the stage, passing me, and I see the back of her blouse has become untucked and hangs out over her skirt. It's this detail the untucked blouse forming a ducktail that brings me back to myself. Prim! The strangled cry comes out of my throat, and my muscles begin to move again. Prim! I don't need to shove through the crowd. The other kids make way immediately, allowing me a straight path to the stage. I reach her, just as she is about to mount the steps. With one sweep of my arm, I push her behind me, I volunteer, I gasp. I volunteer as tribute. There's some confusion on the stage. District 12 hasn't had a volunteer in decades, and the protocol has become rusty. The rule is that once a tribute's name has been pulled from the ball, another eligible boy, if a boy's name has been read, or girl, if a girl's name has been read, can step forward to take his or her place. In some districts, in which winning the reaping is such a great honor, People are eager to risk their lives. The volunteering is complicated. But in District 12, where the word tribute is pretty much synonymous with the word corpse, volunteers are all but extinct. Lovely, says Effie Trinket. But I believe there's a small matter of introducing the reaping winner and then asking the volunteers. And if one does come forth, then we... Um, she trails off, unsure herself. What does it matter? says the mayor. He's looking at me with a pained expression on his face. He doesn't know me, really, but there's a faint recognition there. I am the girl who brings the strawberries. The girl his daughter might have spoken of on occasion. The girl who five years ago stood huddled with her mother and sister as he presented her, the oldest child, with a medal of valor, a medal for her father, vaporized in the mines. Does he remember that? What does it matter? He repeats gruffly. Let her come forward. Prim is screaming hysterically behind me. She's wrapped her skinny arms around me like a vice. No, Katniss, no, you can't go. Prim. Let go, I say harshly, because this is upsetting me and I don't want to cry. When they televise the replay of the reapings tonight, everyone will make note of my tears, and I'll be marked as an easy target, a weakling. I will give no one that satisfaction. Let go. I can feel someone pulling her from my back. I turn and see Gale has lifted Prim off the ground and she's thrashing in his arms. Up you go, Catnip, he says in a voice he's fighting to keep steady, and then he carries Prim off toward my mother. I steel myself and climb the steps. Well, bravo, gushes Effie Trinket. That's the spirit of the games. 
she's pleased to finally have a district with a little action going on in it. What's your name? I swallow hard. Katniss Everdeen, I say. I bet my buttons that was your sister. Don't want her to steal all the glory, do we? Come on, everybody, let's give a big round of applause to our newest tribute, trills Effie Trinket. To the everlasting credit of the people of District 12, not one person claps. Not even the ones holding betting slips, the ones who are usually beyond caring. Possibly because they know me from the hob, or knew my father, or have encountered Prim, who no one can help loving. So instead of acknowledging applause, I stand there, unmoving, while they take part in the boldest form of dissent they can manage. Silence. Which says, we do not agree. We do not condone. All of this is wrong. Then something unexpected happens. At least, I don't expect it, because I don't think of District 12 as a place that cares about me. But a shift has occurred since I stepped up to take Prim's place, and now it seems I have become someone precious. At first one, then another, then almost every member of the crowd touches the three middle fingers of their left hand to their lips and holds it out to me. It is an old and rarely used gesture of our district, occasionally seen at funerals. It means thanks. It means admiration. It means goodbye to someone you love. Now I am truly in danger of crying. But fortunately, Hamish chooses this time to come staggering across the stage to congratulate me. Look at her! Look at this one! He hollers throwing an arm around my shoulders. He's surprisingly strong for such a wreck. I like her. His breath reeks of liquor, and it's been a long time since he's bathed. Lots of... He can't think of the word for a while. Spunk, he says triumphantly. More than you. He releases me and starts for the front of the stage. More than you, he shouts, pointing directly into a camera. Is he addressing the audience, or is he so drunk he might actually be taunting the capital? I'll never know, because just as he's opening his mouth to continue, Hamish plummets off the stage and knocks himself unconscious. He's disgusting, but I'm grateful. With every camera gleefully trained on him, I have just enough time to release the small, choked sound in my throat and compose myself. I put my hands behind my back and stare into the distance. I can see the hills I climbed this morning with Gale. For a moment, I yearn for something. The idea of us leaving the district, making our way in the woods. But I know I was right about not running off because who else would have volunteered for Prim? Hamish is whisked away on a stretcher, and Effie Trinket is trying to get the ball rolling again. What an exciting day! She warbles as she attempts to straighten her wig, which has listed severely to the right. But more excitement to come! It's time to choose our boy tribute! Clearly hoping to contain her tenuous hair situation, she plants one hand on her head as she crosses to the ball that contains the boys' names and grabs the first slip she encounters. She zips back to the podium, and I don't even have time to wish for Gail's safety when she's reading the name. Peter Mellark! Peter Mellark? Oh, no, I think. Not him. Because I recognize this name although I have never spoken directly to its owner, Peter Mellark. No, the odds are not in my favor today. I watch him as he makes his way toward the stage. Medium height, stocky build, ashy blonde hair that falls in waves over his forehead. The shock of the moment is registering on his face. You can see his struggle to remain emotionless. 
but his blue eyes show the alarm I've seen so often in prey. Yet he climbs steadily onto the stage and takes his place. Effie Trinket asks for volunteers, but no one steps forward. He has two older brothers I know. I've seen them in the bakery, but one is probably too old now to volunteer, and the other won't. This is standard. Family devotion only goes so far for most people on reaping day. What I did was the radical thing. The mayor begins to read the long, dull Treaty of Treason, as he does every year at this point. It's required. But I'm not listening to a word. Why him? I think. Then I try to convince myself it doesn't matter. Peter Mellock and I are not friends, not even neighbors. We don't speak. Our only real interaction happened years ago. He's probably forgotten it. But I haven't, and I know I never will. It was during the worst time. My father had been killed in the mine accident three months earlier, in the bitterest January anyone could remember. The numbness of his loss had passed, and the pain would hit me out of nowhere, doubling me over, racking my body with sobs. Where are you? I would cry out in my mind. Where have you gone? Of course, there was never any answer. The district had given us a small amount of money as compensation for his death, enough to cover one month of grieving, at which time my mother would be expected to get a job. Only she didn't. She didn't do anything but sit propped up in a chair, or more often, huddled under the blankets on her bed, eyes fixed on some point in the distance. Once in a while she'd stir, get up as if moved by some urgent purpose, only to then collapse back into stillness. No amount of pleading from Prim seemed to affect her. I was terrified. I suppose now that my mother was locked in some dark world of sadness, but at the time all I knew was that I had lost not only a father, but a mother as well. At eleven years old, with Prim just seven, I took over as head of the family. There was no choice. I bought our food at the market, and cooked it as best I could, and tried to keep Prim and myself looking presentable. Because if it had become known that my mother could no longer care for us, the district would have taken us away from her and placed us in the community home. I'd grown up seeing those home kids at school. The sadness, the marks of angry hands on their faces, the hopelessness that curled their shoulders forward. I could never let that happen to Prim. Sweet, tiny Prim, who cried when I cried before she even knew the reason, who brushed and plaited my mother's hair before we left for school, who still polished my father's shaving mirror each night because he'd hated the layer of coal dust that settled on everything in the scene. The community home would crush her like a bug. So I kept our predicament a secret. But the money ran out, and we were slowly starving to death. There's no other way to put it. I kept telling myself if I could only hold out until May, just May 8th, I would turn twelve and be able to sign up for the tessery and get that precious grain and oil to feed us. Only there were still several weeks to go. We could well be dead by then. Starvation's not an uncommon fate in District 12. Who hasn't seen the victims? Older people who can't work? Children with a family with too many to feed? Those injured in the mines? Straggling through the streets? And one day, you come upon them sitting motionless against a wall or lying in the meadow. You hear the wails from a house, and the peacekeepers are called in to retrieve the body. Starvation is never the cause of death officially. It's always the flu or exposure or pneumonia. But that fools no one. On the afternoon of my encounter with Peter Mellark, the rain was falling in relentless icy sheets. I had been in town, trying to trade some threadbare old baby clothes of Prim's in the public market, but there were no takers. Although I had been to the hob on several occasions with my father, 
I was too frightened to venture into that rough, gritty place alone. The rain had soaked through my father's hunting jacket, leaving me chilled to the bone. For three days we'd had nothing but boiled water with some old dried mint leaves I'd found in the back of a cupboard. By the time the market closed, I was shaking so hard I dropped my bundle of baby clothes in a mud puddle. I didn't pick it up for fear I would keel over and be unable to regain my feet. Besides, no one wanted those clothes. I couldn't go home, because at home was my mother with her dead eyes and my little sister with her hollow cheeks and cracked lips. I couldn't walk into that room with the smoky fire from the damp branches I'd scavenged at the edge of the woods after the coal had run out, my hands empty of any hope. I found myself stumbling along a muddy lane behind the shops that serve the wealthiest townspeople. The merchants live above their businesses, so I was essentially in their backyards. I remember the outlines of garden beds not yet planted for the spring, a goat or two in a pen, one sodden dog tied to a post, hunched defeated in the muck. All forms of stealing are forbidden in District 12, punishable by death, but it crossed my mind that there might be something in the trash bins, and those were fair game. Perhaps a bone at the butcher's, or rotted vegetables at the grocer's. Something no one but my family was desperate enough to eat. Unfortunately, the bins had just been emptied. When I passed the baker's, the smell of fresh bread was so overwhelming I felt dizzy. The ovens were in the back, and a golden glow spilled out the open kitchen door. I stood mesmerized by the heat and the luscious scent until the rain interfered, running its icy fingers down my back, forcing me back to life. I lifted the lid to the baker's trash bin and found it spotlessly, heartlessly bare. Suddenly a voice was screaming at me, and I looked up to see the baker's wife, telling me to move on, and did I want her to call the peacekeepers, and how sick she was of having those brats from the seam pawing through her trash. The words were ugly, and I had no defense. As I carefully replaced the lid and backed away, I noticed him, a boy with blonde hair peering out from behind his mother's back. I'd seen him at school. He was in my year, but I didn't know his name. He stuck with the town kids, so how would I? His mother went back into the bakery, grumbling, but he must have been watching me as I made my way behind the pen that held their pig and leaned against the far side of an old apple tree. The realization that I'd have nothing to take home had finally sunk in. My knees buckled and I slid down the tree trunk to its roots. It was too much. I was too sick and weak and tired. Oh, so tired. Let them call the peacekeepers and take us to the community home, I thought. Or better yet, let me die right here in the rain. There was a clatter in the bakery, and I heard the woman screaming again and the sound of a blow, and I vaguely wondered what was going on. Feet sloshed toward me through the mud, and I thought, It's her. She's coming to drive me away with a stick. But it wasn't her. It was the boy. In his arms, he carried two large loaves of bread that must have fallen into the fire because the crusts were scorched black. His mother was yelling, Feed it to the pig, you stupid creature! Why not? No one decent will buy burned bread! He began to tear off chunks from the burned parts and toss them into the trough, and the front bakery bell rung, and the mother disappeared to help a customer. The boy never even glanced my way, but I was watching him. Because of the bread, because of the red wheel that stood out on his cheekbone. What had she hit him with? My parents never hit us. I couldn't even imagine it. The boy took one look back to the bakery, as if checking that the coast was clear. Then, his attention back on the pig, he threw a loaf of bread in my direction. The second quickly followed, and he sloshed back to the bakery, 
closing the kitchen door tightly behind him. I stared at the loaves in disbelief. They were fine, perfect, really, except for the burned areas. Did he mean for me to have them? He must have, because there they were at my feet. Before anyone could witness what had happened, I shoved the loaves up under my shirt, wrapped the hunting jacket tightly about me, and walked swiftly away. The heat of the bread burned into my skin, but I clutched it tighter, clinging to life. By the time I reached home, the loaves had cooled somewhat, but the insides were still warm. When I dropped them on the table, Prim's hands reached to tear off a chunk, but I made her sit, forced my mother to join us at the table, and poured warm tea. I scraped off the black stuff and sliced the bread. We ate an entire loaf, slice by slice. It was good, hearty bread, filled with raisins and nuts. I put my clothes to dry at the fire, crawled into bed, and fell into a dreamless sleep. It didn't occur to me until the next morning that the boy might have burned the bread on purpose, might have dropped the loaves into the flames, knowing it meant being punished, and then delivered them to me. But I dismiss this. It must have been an accident. Why would he have done it? He didn't even know me. Still, just throwing me the bread was an enormous kindness that would surely have resulted in a beating if discovered. I couldn't explain his actions. We ate slices of bread for breakfast and headed to school. It was as if spring had come overnight. Warm, sweet air, fluffy clouds. At school, I passed the boy in the hall. His cheek had swelled up and his eye had blackened. He was with his friends and didn't acknowledge me in any way. But as I collected Prim and started for home that afternoon, I found him staring at me from across the schoolyard. Our eyes met for only a second. Then he turned his head away. I dropped my gaze, embarrassed, and that's when I saw it. The first dandelion of the year. A bell went off in my head. I thought of the hours spent in the woods with my father, and I knew how we were going to survive. To this day, I can never shake the connection between this boy, Peter Mellark, and the bread that gave me hope and the dandelion that reminded me that I was not doomed. And more than once, I have turned in the school hallway and caught his eyes trained on me, only to quickly flit away. I feel like I owe him something, and I hate owing people. Maybe if I had thanked him at some point, I'd be feeling less conflicted now. I thought about it a couple of times, but the opportunity never seemed to present itself. And now it never will because we're going to be thrown into an arena to fight to the death. Exactly how am I supposed to work in a thank you in there? Somehow it won't seem sincere if I'm trying to slit his throat. The mayor finishes the dreary treaty of treason and motions for Peter and me to shake hands. His are as solid and warm as those loaves of bread. Peter looks me right in the eye and gives my hand what I think is meant to be a reassuring squeeze. Maybe it's just a nervous spasm. We turn back to face the crowd as the anthem of Panem plays. Oh well, I think. There will be twenty-four of us. Odds are someone else will kill him before I do. Of course, the odds have not been very dependable of late.